Hey everybody, Jonathan Corbett here. I have this YouTube channel on real estate photography and I know that a lot of people are gonna be wondering, hey Jonathan, I'm interested in learning about real estate photography, but I'm not exactly sure why I should listen to you and I'm not sure if watching your videos is gonna be worth my time at all. So who even are you and why should I listen to what you have to say? All right, so in this video, I'm gonna be talking about my entire journey way back from when I was, before I was ever a photographer, why I got started in photography and all of the challenges and things I learned up till today. Uh, as, as a one man show, I was making over $250,000 as a real estate photographer. And today I'm making over, or just under $500,000 in revenue uh, between my photography business, my vacation rental, and other passive income that is all surrounding my main career as a real estate photographer. And I also wanna teach how you guys can do this too, because making over $250,000 as a single solo, photography, solo photographer isn't easy. You have to learn some specific things. If you watch other YouTube channels, you're never gonna make it to $250,000 because there's very efficient, quick, man, just powerful tips that are not being taught elsewhere because I've looked and I decided nothing gets me going like watching a tutorial on how to do something and then the person who is teaching you how to do it is doing it the incredibly slow, incorrect way. And they're getting likes and comments for it. Like, hey, thank you, I'm so glad you taught me how to do this. Which means bad information is being spread. And I will tell you this, more than money, more than like fame and fortune, nothing motivates me like seeing something that is done wrong and wanting to correct it. That is actually the main motivation behind all of this. And with that being said, let me go ahead and introduce to you who I am, where I got started, and where I am today. In 2006 to 2008, way back in the day, I started shooting cars and shooting nighttime photography because I was just a kid and that's what I was interested in. And the reason I got started in 2006, 2007, 2008, that whole area is because that's when I got my driver's permit and I was able to drive myself out and do photography. So first off, I was interested in doing long exposure and that's the first time I ever, I can still remember this, I was sitting in the middle of a street and I'll try to provide as many photos, if I still have them, when I'm talking about it. I was sitting in the uh, middle of a four lane highway with my car sitting in the turning lane and I was trying to figure out in the middle of the night how I can get my shutter to open for 30 seconds. So that was my first real night out with a camera and learning the basics of like aperture, ISO and shutter speed. I was into cars, I still am into cars today so I wanted to get good photos of my car anyway, not to go full in depth into this. The point is that is where my roots were. I graduated high school in 2008 and I moved off to college. I did not study photography. I wish that I had studied photography, but at the time I didn't think photography was an option. A lot of people like you, I'm sure, figured that photography is a fun idea, but it's not a realistic opportunity. And the people who do get to do it really got lucky. A lot of people try, a few people just make it because the odds fall in their favor. That is not the case and I'll show you, like I said, more about that. But anyway, in 2008, I went off to college and continued doing photography as a hobby, but I was mostly focused on school. I was studying music. I was a pretty good musician. I had won competitions in high school uh, in the Music Teachers National Association. I had gotten honor honorably mentioned for performance. I submitted some compositions and actually won state and regional competitions for that. But by the time I got to college, I really looked around and saw that I was just not a musician. Uh, I didn't fit in with the industry. I appreciated some of my professors, but a lot of the professors and I were just on different wavelengths and I felt like the odd man out. In fact, I've always felt like the odd man out in a lot of ways um, in a lot of places because I was homeschooled and stuff, but I was looking and expecting the music industry and the music department to be like my first real home, like when Harry Potter arrives to Hogwarts or something, right? That was not, <laughs> not the case at all. 
My best friend in college ended up being my roommate. And anyway, at night, I would explore campus a little bit. Once again, usually bring my tripod and camera around, just getting some cool shots around campus at night. And I would always end up at the visual arts department. And I would look at the projects that they had on display that week. And it doesn't matter what it was, whether it was painting, whether it was digital art, whether it was photography, I was always incredibly interested in what they were doing. And it started, I didn't know it at the time, but I started to feel and be able to articulate within me at the time that I wish I hadn't of been a music major. So this is around 2010, 2011. And I took a year abroad because music just kept getting worse and worse. And I stopped practicing, which made my performance uh, fall off just because, man, I really did hate it. And the year abroad, I did a ton of traveling, a ton of travel photography. I traveled to 10, over 10 different countries, including Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Czech Republic, Sweden, France, England, Scotland. It was fantastic. It was one of the best years of my life. And it also gave me this space to realize that, man, music really wasn't what I wanted to do. But I weighed my options and fell into the sunk cost fallacy where I just thought that, man, I've been doing this all of my life. I can't leave it now, right? Well, I came back to the States. I started taking classes again. And I thought to myself, man, I'm stuck in a practice room for two or three hours every day. I really need to be doing more than that. And if I could start off with something brand new, even if I had to start off completely from zero and spend two to three hours doing something, I would rather do almost anything than torturing myself in a practice room playing music that I don't really enjoy for people who I don't really love and don't really care about me. And I'm sure a lot of other people have felt the same way in whatever industry you might be working in, whether you're in your cubicle, whether you're a bank teller, whether you're, you're working at Subway making sandwiches for people, or just any dead end job, even if it's a good job, I've known doctors who are like, man, I hate my job, but I can't escape. It's like golden handcuffs. I was there. And I actually decided that, hey, you know what? No matter what it takes, I'm gonna figure out something. And then I thought to myself, man, you know what I would really love doing for two to three hours or more every day, just really practicing and digging into it? It would be photography. If I could choose anything on this world to do all day long, I would choose photography. And that's when I started getting serious about it. So I had spent a year abroad, I was back on campus and I had said that I had, did I, did I tell you? Maybe I didn't, but I was interested in the, in the film department and before I went abroad, I would even kind of get, become friends with some of the uh, film department students, hang out with them a little bit and inevitably end up on set with them, either holding lights, carrying equipment, sometimes even acting in some of their stuff. And it was great. But I think they could also tell, like they could sniff it on me that I was interested in joining the film department and they w that I, I wished I was one of them. And they didn't react well to that. They were very unfriendly to any questions I had like, hey man, like what's it like being a photographer? Just, just perfectly safe, unharmful questions. And they would not share those details with me. And they'd also get very distant and to the point where I think they definitely knew I was interested in considering switching my major and they just completely shut me out. So coming back from my year abroad, I wasn't exactly worried about making friends or making enemies in the film department. And a lot of the people that I had been kind of hanging out with were now starting their own businesses and charging stuff. And I saw some of their work that was starting to be shared online because Facebook was like just getting traction. And I thought to myself, like, wow, their work really isn't that good. And I had just spent a year abroad not practicing music like I should have. I was taking pictures the whole time. And I said, you know, if there's any time to get started in photography, why not just do it now? 
So, even though I wasn't a film major, even though I wasn't in the visual arts department, I started offering to do photography for senior portraits for the school. I would approach the school and ask them if they needed anything. And from the beginning, right out the gate, I started charging, never did anything for free. And I charged more than the film department students. And this really uh, caught the attention of some of my old friends, uh, some of the people in the film department who were like, what business do you have stepping into my territory, essentially? They, they were very territorial. And I'm sure a lot of people also experience the same thing when you hop into real estate photography, uh, Facebook groups, or any wedding uh, Facebook group. You're not gonna find people who are exactly friend to you. You're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna run into a lot of hostility. I didn't really apologize for starting it. My clients did not mind that I wasn't a film major. They liked the work that I was doing for them. I wasn't able to express or articulate this at the time, but I am now. And I had this feeling that said, hey, you know what? And I respond to this anytime someone asks me if I went to film school or went to photography school. My answer to them is this. No, I didn't go to school for this. I was born for this. And I really believe that in my heart. If I had to choose between something, I would much rather be born to do photography than going to school for photography. Because I think being born for something, being made for something, is a thousand times better than going to school for it. So that's how I felt about the whole thing. And that's where I s plant my official start as a photographer, because I did start getting paid for it. I had clients that enjoyed it. Fast forward a few years, I was out of college, I was married, and my wife and I were living in our first apartment, not in College Dale, Tennessee, where I went to school, but I went to Columbia, South Carolina. That's where I moved to. Columbia, South Carolina, I wasn't completely still sure that photography was gonna make it. I was trying, I had made a little bit of money while I was in college, was learning a lot of things, I had a website, I had a portfolio, but when I got out of college, I decided to go all in with a wide net, trying to figure out more about myself and also what the opportunities were out there. So I volunteered and I worked in a lot of different places. So I was doing my own business as a photographer. I was introducing myself to other photographers in the city and ended up working as assistant for two separate photographers. One was a school portrait photographer and the other one was a renowned commercial photographer by the name of Jeff Amberg. I don't think he would mind me uh, saying that. Um, I worked under him, but he ended up really teaching me a lot. So I was working for myself. I was working for these two photographers. I was volunteering teaching English to refugee family uh, most evenings. I was volunteering uh, at a local school teaching math um, first and second period to uh, students. I was also volunteering at a local nonprofit radio sta station producing, doing audio production for them, uh, you know, post-processing and stuff. Am I forgetting anything else that I was doing? Uh, I was also teaching piano lessons to some students. So my days are pretty full. Uh, my wife was working nights and it was honestly a pretty hard year, but I learned a lot. And looking back on it, it was fantastic because I got to shoot some pretty awesome events. I shot for the Raleigh Convention Center. I picked up some really cool event stuff. I got started in real estate. Not really started in real estate because I had done a few real estate shoots when I was in college, but this is when I was really started you know, pursuing it and getting some basic income. And I also um, photographed some pretty important people because Columbia, South Carolina was the capital of the state. So I got to uh, photograph Chief Justice Finney, who was the first African-American Chief Justice in the United States. Did some amazing uh, work for them. So I had some immediate su success. But truthfully, I was only making at the end of the, of the, end of the year like around $20,000 or less because I was doing so much volunteering. I was working for other photographers where you don't get paid all that much, especially for 
the photographers I was working for because it, they didn't give me a lot of hours. I would just show up, you know, when they needed a second person and that, and that sort of thing. But all things considered at the end of the year, I realized that what I was doing wasn't working out. Number one, because it was our first year of marriage and my wife, who I love very much at the time, was kind of expressing concerns like, hey babe, not sure this is working out. <laughs> not with our marriage, but like our financial situation at the time. And our living situation, we were kind of bearing at the time because we understood it'd be tough for our first few years, but we didn't understand how tough it would be. Uh, our mattress was on the floor the first year. We had an apartment that wasn't in a good area of town. Uh, and I'll talk more about that in a second. But our mattress was on the floor and the roach situation was so bad that in the middle of the night, roaches that were crawling around the floor would crawl up on your mattress and crawl underneath the covers. So you'd wake up some nights because you feel something crawling on you and it's like a full grown roach. And I'm not talking like a little roach or like a water bug. I'm talking like, I'm talking like a fully evolved, fully mature roach with like hairy legs. Like it was awful, the things that fly around. Anyway, that was getting to us. Um, not really getting ahead financially was getting to us because just living on that was not very easy. But the worst part about it is I realized that a lot of the people I was volunteering for weren't appreciating my time working for them. Even when I was working with refugees, they appreciated my time, but lots of times I'd give them resources like, hey, if you really want to learn English and really you know, get ahead, here are some books, like some children's books, like, you know, the, the red cat jumped over the, you know, the, the black dog, you know, kind of things. You need to learn this vocabulary and practice reading these books. And, they, and then they would never pick it up. So I didn't see the point of volunteering so much of my time to people who weren't going to take that time and do something with it. So those are some just lessons that I learned. But the biggest lesson that I learned was some advice that I was following from my dad. My dad, I love very much. He's given me some great advice in my life. But one of the pieces of advice he gave me that wasn't correct was, hey, Jonathan, money isn't that important. Just as long as what you're doing, what you love, and you're doing good for the world, that's all that matters. Don't worry about the money. And I really took that to heart for a number of years, which is why I had volunteered so much in college and after college. But the apartment we were staying in wasn't just uncomfortable and like insect ridden. Our car got broken into, so my photography equipment got stolen. Our car bro got broken into twice, that is. Our financial situation was bad enough to where I had to ask people for money. When it got really bad, I had to, I called up my brother one time and asked him for money. That was personally my lowest, lowest, forgive me if I have um, a little bit of pride, but I didn't want to do that type of thing. And being forced to do that is not something I ever wanted to do it again. Um, but that's not the lowest. The lowest was because my wife was working nights, lots of times on her nights off, she would just stay up all night and like hang around while I slept. And she came to me and said, hey, Jonathan, at night, I hear some funny noises. And I'm like, yeah, well, we live in an apartment, love. Like, there's gonna be funny noises. And she's like, no, I really feel like they're strange noises. And I've learned to listen to Nikki when she says some, something like that now, right? But at the time, I just kind of brushed it off as nothing. Well, one night in particular, Nikki said, hey, Jonathan, you need to get up. There's someone at the door. I was like, are you sure? She's like, yes. And I got up. And I quietly as I could got to the front door. And when I looked at the front door, it was something like out of a horror movie because the doorknob that I was looking at was slowly turning. And then someone was pushing on the door to test to see if it was open or not. And thank God the deadlock was locked. So they would push it until the deadlock hit and they would test it again, and very quietly, they would let go and put the door back to where it was. And I realized that Nikki, these sounds that she had been hearing, had been this guy who was regularly coming 
by our apartment. He probably lived in our complex. He probably saw he probably saw my car and broke into it, which is why he stole some of my photography stuff. And then he figured out, oh, well, this guy has stuff to steal and he was targeting us specifically. And I have no idea what he would have done if one of those nights, Nikki and I forgot to lock the door. But I doubt he would have come unprepared. And that was a few weeks before our lease was coming up and we were planning to move anyway out of, out of town. But that night really got to me and realize, it made me realize I can't spend my life and all of my extra time and energy and resources worried about other people. I need to make sure I'm looking out for me, I'm looking out for my family. All right, so that was a turning point for me. I realized that not having a successful career, not providing for your family and really making sure your four walls are safe was not an option. And I realized that I had to have to make something work with either music or photography and it would have to be big. I approached Jeff Amberg one day and he didn't know about my apartment, you know, the attempting break in or anything, but I was really reconsidering if photography would be an option because I needed to provide money to my family. And my wife worked full time, but uh, that probably wouldn't be enough either. I asked Jeff and I said, hey Jeff, I really want to be like a full time, dedicated, successful photographer like you. Do you think I can do it? Do you think I can get there? And he was honest with me. And I'm telling you this guys, if you do not have someone in your life who can be honest with you and provide you honest feedback, not sugar-coated, polite, ambiguous advice. I'm talking being direct with you, then you're missing out. Anyway, so Jeff spoke with me honestly, candidly, and I, and I appreciate that. He said, you know, Jonathan, you're, you're pretty good with photography. You can edit fine. You have all the skills you need to be a great photographer, but you're never going to be able to do this for a living unless you learn business. And then he followed up with the cliche thing, like 80% business, 20% photography. And at the time I really resented that because I'm very much um, dedicated to photography. I love uh, the art and the craft. At the time thought that people who kind of peddled and sales pitched stuff were just kind of frauds. I don't know, they were just posers. They were people who were ruining the industry. So I kind of resented him for that answer for a while. But after thinking about it for a while, I said, I thought to myself anyway, you know, just because it has to be 80% business, 20% photography, doesn't mean you have to be any less of a photographer. And I figured out that, I, that it should be, you should work all day long, as hard as you possibly can. Every second needs to be accounted for to make sure that you are the best photographer you can possibly be so that after you're done working hard at being a better photographer, when your head hits the pillow at night, you're out like a light. And when you're that good as a photographer, you need to be four times better in business. That's how I looked at it. And another big piece of advice Jeff gave me is like, hey, Jonathan, you're about to move out of town. You're about to move to Greensboro, which is where I am now. He said, when you move to Greensboro, you should do something that I did. And that is put down your camera for six to 12 months and just do sales. Find a sales job and sell something. It doesn't matter what you're selling, just sell something and learn the art of sales. I didn't wanna do that. <laughs> but when we moved to Greensboro, rather than trying to find other photographers to work for and starting my own business, I, did, I just put my camera away and I started applying for jobs. And I got a job because I'm a car guy. I started working in sales at a car dealership and I'm not proud of that. I'm not saying that I'm a car salesman, but he said, 
work anywhere. I like cars. I'm probably gonna buy cars a lot throughout my lifetime. I wanna work, find out the inner dealings of the dealership, right? So I could help myself get a good deal on cars. And I have learned that. But um, while I was there, I didn't learn all that much from the dealership, but I did meet someone who was another salesman at the dealership who was in fantastic, who was a fantastic individual and his name was Basilio. And I've done an interview with him, but I want to do another one at his restaurant. I'm going to reach out to him and see if I can do that. Yeah, so I worked there with the intention of being there for six months. I hated the way they did business and thought it was wrong, so I lasted two months. <laughs> but thanks to Basilio, a few other people at the dealership, I learned what I needed to. I quit, and then I came back to photography, and I came back to photography with a vengeance. I cannot tell you how motiv motivated I was to hit the road on photography and be the best professional I ever could have imagined that I could be. Because Jeff Amberg was right. I did learn important concepts and basics, fundamental, foundational concepts and ideas that I knew would help me be a much more profitable photographer than I ever thought I could be. And it's not necessarily by jipping people either like car dealerships do. It's by understanding customers, understanding service, understanding what you have to do to get a sale and not also not being afraid to do it. What year was that? That was around the year 2013, 2014. So I came back to photography. I thought about all the types of photography I had been doing up to that point. That was including commercial, um, business, lifestyle, couples, engagements, and weddings. And I had done a lot of stuff, events and real estate. And I looked at the economy of my area and I was like, if I was gonna put my money on anything and also do something that I enjoyed, I would put my money on real estate. I had no idea what I was doing, okay? I didn't know how to get clients. I didn't know I didn't know what I was doing in the real estate world, the real estate photography world anyway. I didn't know how to approach a, a client. I didn't know uh, what type of stuff that I should shoot if I really wanted to pursue this and be one of those incredible real estate photographers that you see online. I didn't understand exactly how they got those types of photos, but I knew that nothing was gonna stop me. And in those times, there wasn't, YouTube channels online, you could just look up and learn how to do the basics. The only way I learned was by going out and shooting a house, delivering the photos and getting uh, feedback from that. So sometimes I'd get feedback that was great and sometimes I'd get feedback that wasn't so great. And through the raw process of doing that, I learned industry expectations and secrets and things that people like directly from realtors. The first year, I made around $60,000 just from hustling, calling, emailing, and figuring out how to market, how to approach realtors. After just a few, like one or two more years uh, more, I made my first six figures, and that was not knowing anything uh, starting out. And then when I turned 27, even though I was already making six figures, I was really trying to push myself and work hard and uh, one of the things I would do constantly is listening to podcasts and YouTube channels now that YouTube and podcasts were kind of becoming a thing and listening to kind of like self-improvement type of things, how to better manage your time, how to work your finances better. And I was listening to a certain individual one day, I know exactly who it is. One of the things they said is that you should find out what your working potential is, meaning how much are you as an individual capable? What are your limits? How many hours of work in a week or in a month can you put in consistently? How much stress on a given day can you handle before you lose it? Just test your limits and find out what they are because once you know what they are, you can move forward knowing how much you're capable of. Uh, and it really is important to know what your limits are so you don't get too close to them either. So when I turned 27, I decided to find out, all right, what is my true limits? What is my true potential? So I decided to work as hard, as long, as focused, 
as I possibly could for three years. And in those three years, I was able to buy a vacation rental, I tripled my income, and my life changed forever. And in those three years of incredibly hard focus and drive, I also unlocked things within my industry, within real estate photography, that I have never seen on any YouTube channel or anything else. And there are true secrets you can unlock to take yourself from just like a six-figure successful photographer to an ultra successful photographer who on their own is able to do a quarter of a million dollars in a year. Anyway, so I did that for three years and then I turned 30. And I thought to myself, okay, I know my limits now. I've been burning it pretty hard. I need to now transition, pivot a little bit and get a good life balance because my wife and I don't want me working around the clock for the rest of my life, right? We want to have a life for ourselves. So that is the year I hired my first assistant, James, who was fantastic. And uh, we brought him on for two years with the understanding that he would go and start his own business. Um, so I'm actually helping him with that and advise him anytime he needs help out in Colorado. And then also when I hired him, when I turned 30, that was also 2020. So 2020 happened and the world turns upside down and it could not have been better timing for me to have an assistant because uh, business died for a few weeks and then it rocketed up to more, to more busy than we'd ever been. Anyway, long story short, it's been two or three years since then. I'm making this at the very end of 2022 and I'm making just under $500,000. Um, I still have an employees. I'm planning on scaling my business even further. And I'm really dedicated as well to getting back to my roots of teaching, which is something I know I've always wanted to done and help other photographers uh, learn some of the secrets that I've learned and also help people live better lives because there are pieces of advice and information that is shared on popular YouTube channels that can really drive people to be misguided and inefficient and nothing motivates me like I have said before uh, as correcting some something that's being spread that is not correct. So that is my primary motivation behind all of this. I really hope you enjoy uh, some of the business tips that I give. Um, some of the editing tutorials that I make that are specifically designed to show you how to do things and do them with better results faster. And if you guys have any questions or you want to interact with me on a personal level, please make sure to leave comments down below because I do interact with all of you as much as I possibly can. And since I'm making this video, this is just the YouTube channel getting started. I'm going to have plenty of time uh, to interact with you guys one-on-one -on -one and make videos about your specific questions. So without further ado, that's who I am. Uh, this is Jonathan Corbett. If you're interested in learning more from me, please do subscribe and I look forward to helping you learn, apply, and succeed.